Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to a new week, and uh, hope you had a good week uh, last week. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, maybe one of us, George here, would you mind leading us in prayer, please? Okay, anybody else? Yes, go ahead, success. I will pray. My Father, my God, I want to thank you this morning. Thank you for this lecture. Thank you for all of us here today. Thank you for giving us the privilege of being alive. Receive all the glory in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. My Father, Father, my God, will commit this lecture into you. Thanks. Please, Lord, guide us and impart us with your spirit in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And give us the spirit of learning and understanding. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, success. Thank you. Amen. All right. So let's get into our session this morning. Uh, just a little bit of a review of what we did last week. So we started off this course with looking at the introduction to the fivefold ministry. Uh, and very important points that we covered was that the ministry gift is given by God. And it is not something of our own choice. Uh, God bestows it upon people. Right. And so when we are fulfilling whatever call God has given for our lives, we are fulfilling uh, the divine call of God. So it's not just a natural, uh, you know, uh, in the natural we say, OK, I'm a pastor, I'm a prophet. Yes. But uh, but in the but in the spiritual, we are fulfilling a divine call of God. Right. And we looked at the purpose of the fivefold ministry. Right. Uh, the purpose is not so that we can exalt ourselves so that we, you know, uh, we can gain riches uh, or we can become popular and famous. But we saw the threefold purpose there for the perfecting of the saints so that the saints can do the work of the ministry and for the building of the body of Christ. So whether we are a pastor, prophet, evangelist, teacher, anything in the fivefold ministry, worship leader, our main intention is that we are equipping the saints, right? Uh, of course, and as we are equipping the saints, we are also a work in progress. We are also learning. Two is we are equipping them to do the work of the ministry. And by doing that, we are building the body of Christ, right? And then we also looked at um, the briefly about the role, which is the function and the uh, ministry function and the ministry gift. So we saw that the ministry function is something that is uh, that has a special anointing upon people. We use that example of Billy Graham, right? He he ha his functions as the evangelist and then you have the ministry gift where we all can function in the ministry gift right so with this as our foundation let's get into the next topic uh second point second chapter uh the evangelist and jesus as our example now by show of hands can you uh, i just like to know how many of you are called to be evangelists if you know that god has called you sure you know i am going to be an evangelist uh how many of you are here uh, uh okay Jafina says yes anybody else you know you're going to be an evangelist right all right Okay, no problem. So we'll see, we we'll learned this morning about what it is to be an evangelist and how did Jesus model us as an example, right? Jesus set the example, and in every aspect, Jesus is our best example, whether it is the fivefold ministry, whether it is uh, you know, character, that is hard work, everything. Jesus is our best example, right? 
So let's get into chapter two. And let's look at the first one there. The Greek word for evangel means to proclaim the good news. Right? So that's the Greek word. Evangel means to proclaim the good news. Now, uh, if you and I proclaim the good news, we are evangelizing. Right? Our calling may not be an evangelist. Right? God may not have said, you know, spoken to us and said, okay, you are going to be an evangelist. But the but what does it say here? The Greek word means to proclaim the good news. So you can proclaim the good news to your friends, to your neighbor, to your family, maybe two or three people around where you stay. What are you doing? You are evangelizing the good news. Right. So now if some of you say, hey, I'm a pastor or I'm an apostle, I'm a prophet, so I can I don't want to learn about uh, evangelist. Evangelist is let them learn it. No, uh, right? we all will evangelize and we all will be using the ministry gift of evangelism right? Uh, of being an evangelist. So Romans chapter one and verse 16. Let's read that. It's a common verse. Romans one and verse 16 feel free to stop me if you have any questions uh, and uh, we can take that up as well so romans chapter 1 and verse 16 go ahead anybody can read romans chapter 1 verse 16 for i am not ashamed of the gospel of christ for it is the power of the god to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Amen. Thank you, Anita. So we see here, uh, Paul is writing here and saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because the gospel, the message that we are sharing is the power of God unto salvation. Right? So the evangelist is primarily a proclaimer of the gospel. Right. Uh, so we learned also in lifestyle evangelism, right? So for example, I I don't think I'm called to be an evangelist, right? I, I'm not really sure, right? I think uh, my calling is more of a pastoral uh, ministry, but I love to evangelize. I love to reach out to people. I love to you know do these events and programs and uh, you know share the love of Christ with people. Now, I may not be an evangelist, but one thing I know is when I am proclaiming the gospel, it is the power of God unto salvation, right? So, so it doesn't matter. I, I don't have to wait and say, okay, God, uh, you know, you you first tell me what is my calling, or what is it that you've called me to do, and only then I will start off. No, right? I can begin because remember what Jesus said in. Um, in his last day on earth, he met with the disciples and he gave them a great commission. What did he say? He said, what did he say? He said, go, preach the gospel, baptize in the name. He didn't say, go find out what your calling is. Right? Did he say that? No. He said, go and preach. That's all. That's all that the, you know, the commission was, go preach the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation, right? Now, let's read Luke chapter 4, 17 to 19. Luke 4, 17 to 19. So I may be looking here and there. It's just that I'm looking at my notes, so please bear with me. Right. Luke chapter 4, verse 17 and 19. 17 to the 19. scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, John. So, just a background. Now, 
Jesus is 30 years old odd. He's ready to start his ministry. And he goes back, he opens up the scrolls. And, uh, you know, in the temples, they would open the scrolls and read about it. And usually what they would do was uh, they would have something similar to what we have. They would bring up a few points from that topic, right? So, um, so in, uh, just before the early church, during Jesus' time, um, they had Pharisees, they had Sadducees, but the Pharisees were more of, you know, preaching, teaching, equipping the people. So, the, so, so during that time, Jesus goes, he opens the scroll and he says, the spirit of the Lord, quoting from Isaiah, and then he says something after that. He says, today the scripture is fulfilled. And they all become angry. And they'll say, what are you talking about? Uh, because they knew, and they knew that this is, uh, this is something wrong. There's something, uh, this is going beyond our expectations, right? And what does he say there? Preaching the gospel, which is the good news, to the poor, healing the oppressed, and then the list goes on. Now, it's interesting to see the word, the poor, right? When we say the poor, it's not only the poor materialistically, not people who are like, okay, poor people on the street. No, it was poor in also those who, you know, uh, don't know about the gospel, those who haven't witnessed, uh, you know, this, this Messiah, those who haven't tasted the goodness of God. So they were poor in spirit, right? Uh, so it was more, even the poor, those who don't have, you know, materialistic things and living in a poor life, but more of it was spiritual. Now, remember the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they knew everything from the, you know, the scriptures, but they were poor because they just knew it as head knowledge. It did not become something that they could, you know, it did not become revelation in their heart. And that is why when we read from uh, the book of Matthew, from the time John the Baptist is, has come in, we see that there's a spirit of coldness among the people. There was, there was just a spirit of religiosity. They're just being religious. Right? Okay, we have to go, we have to do this, we have to pray, we have to do these feasts. Why? Because our ancestors did, we are doing it. Right? So Jesus comes and he says, no more of that. I'm here to proclaim a message, and that message is about bringing the poor to become rich, to be rich in the spirit, to uh, to heal the sick, to heal the op oppressed, and he goes on. So, as an evangelist, as a person who is who has been called by God, as a believer, you and I are to preach the gospel and bring forth these attributes, right? Good news to the poor, healing the oppressed, healing the sick. And now here's the best part. When we're doing it, we don't do it on our own effort, right? We can trust God. You know, we say, okay, God, you've done the work. Now I'm just doing what you have called me to do, right? So now let's look at how the Lord Jesus functioned as an evangelist, right? In the book of Hebrews, it says that he is our mediator, he's our high priest, right? Uh, he's our shepherd, and we looked at it last class, right? How he fulfills all the fivefold ministry. Now, how did Jesus be an evangelist? How did he function as an evangelist? Right, let's look at those points there on your notes, chapter 2. First point is Jesus was empowered. Right? Jesus was empowered. Now, there's a Greek word called dunamis. Right? Uh, and the meaning of that Greek word dunamis is really powerful. It says it means dynamite. Right? dynamite uh, explosive power and how many of you have uh, you know uh, been next to a dynamite it's quite intimidating right to see those uh, 
I'm not talking about those small crackers which we burst. I'm talking about a dynamite, right? And it's explosive, it's dangerous. When a dynamite bursts, what happens? It doesn't just affect uh, people around in that area. It, it usually spreads to far away places. But the effects of the dynamite is seen, right? Now, now in the scriptures, it says that we have the dunamis power, the dynamite power of God within us, right? The Lord Jesus was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, can you picture this? Who was the Lord Jesus? He was the Son of God, right? Came into this world. Hebrews says he left his glory. He came and he lived as a man. And he could have just relaxed, no? Just relax, wait till 30. He knew that he's going to start at 30. He, he knew everything. But he didn't do that. What does it say? That he grew in stature and wisdom. So even though he was powerful, he depended on the Holy Spirit to empower him even more. Right? And let's read these couple of verses here. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. And then we'll pull up some examples as well. Luke 4 and verse 18. Anybody can read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Thank you, John. I just want to focus on that word. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me. Right? Anointed me. And last last week we looked at the importance of being anointed. Right? Uh, the importance of being receiving a fresh anointing uh, for our ministry. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me. The Lord Jesus didn't say, hey, you know, Father, the Holy Spirit and me are all one. So I don't need any anointing and all. I just have to say it. It will be done. No, he says, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me, empowered me. I am empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let's read Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Acts 10 and verse 38. Yes. Yes, anybody can read. Acts 10 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Amen. Thank you, John. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Right? Matthew 2, verse 2 to 4. Matthew chapter 2, verse 2 through 4. Yeah. Yes, anybody can read. Matthew 2, 2 to 4. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard that uh, this, he was disturbed at all. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, John. It's Hebrews 2, 2 to 4 uh, on the notes. Sorry. It's Hebrews 2, chapter 2, verse 2 to 4. Hebrews 2, chapter 2 to 4. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Yeah, thank you so much, Rosalind. Now here's a point that we must all understand. When we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, signs, miracles and wonders will follow us right now we don't have to 
worry about uh, okay you know what i've prayed for so many people but they've not got healed or you know i've uh, i i don't i'm not sure if this is going to happen we don't have to do that we don't have to worry about it why because if we are empowered by the holy spirit what follows says this signs wonders and miracles now let's look at a few examples right it's not on your notes but in luke chapter 8 right the lord jesus uh was 26 to 28 i think it is where the lord jesus sets sail and he goes to the land of gerasenes right and what happens there there's this demon possessed person they come running towards jesus right and they give a little background about this uh, demon possessed person also you know, they tied him up they chained him he would scratch himself um, they tied him up in the graveyards and nothing really worked people were scared of him right the the community the society was scared of this demon possessed man but jesus stepped foot in that land and what happened after that the demons themselves came running and said oh son of god the messiah or the anointed one why have you come so early before our appointed time when we are empowered by the holy spirit demons understand who is inside us right and we saw that in jesus's life right in in the apostle paul again he he goes about in all his missionary journeys he started churches he raised up leaders he he went on these missionary journeys now think of this can we do it on our own flesh it's i would say it's impossible right uh, because if you read about the apostle paul and the things that he's been through it is nothing but the empowering of the holy spirit now we must understand also that it is not you know take a flight fly to galatia from galatia take another flight go to corinth and take another flight okay i finished my three missionary no right we know that it was hard ground it was either by sea or by walk and he was you know uh, going through all these turmoils and people just buffeting him from every side but he was empowered by the holy spirit I love what he says to the Philippian church sitting in prison he's he's probably beaten and bruised and he's saying rejoice in the Lord always again I say rejoice now how can we do that we can do that only if we are empowered by the Holy Spirit right another example would be in Acts 28 the apostle paul goes to the island of malta right that's his final journey he's going back he's going to rome and he knows his end is near they stop at the island of malta there's a shipwreck he's there they're putting a fire in together and he gets bit by a snake what is apostle paul's response you know some of the versions say he was bit by a viper now a viper is a venomous snake if you if you look at it uh, if you study about the viper when poison goes into the body it 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 just goes straight into the blood the the viper the rattlesnakes the the poison goes straight into the blood and you know a little bit of national geography here uh it takes 15 minutes for your heart to start pounding and within 20 minutes you're dead right because the bloodstream it just blocks your arteries the blood is not flowing and you die of a cardiac arrest or a heart attack now there's no medicines now we have anti-venoms and all of those things but paul is in malta he gets bit by a snake what does he do he shakes it off do we see any uh anything else about that nothing he doesn't say okay now i have to tie a cloth around it or uh, i have to just uh, you know call up luke and check with him uh, because he's a physician he may give me some advice no he shakes off that snake goes about doing 
what God has called them to do. Right? Now, what is the lesson that we learned here? It's a powerful lesson. When we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, even the natural, we are able to control it. We're able to go beyond the natural. If you look at it, Paul should have died within half an hour. Right. And this happened even previously. After his first missionary journey, they caught him, they beat him, they threw him uh, down a cliff, and they thought he was dead. They came and saw him. But he woke up and he went. Right. Uh, so when we are empowered as evangelists, we need to be empowered. As believers in Christ, we need to be empowered. The moment we start something in the flesh, the flesh will profit nothing, right? But a work that is started by the Spirit will always profit. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. It's not our work, right? Now, when you look at even in the Old Testament, empowered people, beautiful, Moses. Uh, and there's a long list, you know, we can go on. Was, Moses was empowered by God, right? There's no way you can lead six billion people on your own. And all of them are grumbling and crying. and But he led them all. He saw the glory of God. He was empowered by God. Elijah, you know, who who says who says to uh, the king of Israel during that time, he says, you know what? If you're not listening, there's not going to be rain. Or who gives an open challenge? You know, 400 prophets of Baal and... Uh, uh, Aserod, all these prophets, and he alone stood against them. Why? Because he was empowered by God. What about David? All of them are hiding. This huge man, Goliath, in front of them. David says, no, God is with me. I'm empowered by God. So, very important. When we are in ministry or in anything that we're doing, we want to serve God. Make sure that you're empowered by God. Right? Now, if you feel weak, right, we all go through those seasons, right? I, mean, I felt that, you know, we feel weak. We feel, God, where are you? Uh, I feel alone. I feel that there's no power. I feel there's no strength. Go back. Go to your room. Close the door and pray. And seek God. Ask Him for the empowering strength. And so, no matter what we see ahead, you know, especially during a time and a season that we are in, we really need to be empowered. You know why? Because it's anti conversion bill. There are people who are saying, you know, uh, all kinds of false doctrines coming within the church. People are saying there is no God, there is no Jesus. And, uh, you know, all new belief systems, uh, the occult, the mysticism, yoga, all these things are taking up the world. Now, if we want to be impactful evangelists, we need to be empowered. Because when we're empowered, we will see signs, miracles, and wonders. Right? Remember this one time, uh, I was, I think it was many, many years back. Uh, I met this young man and uh, we were talking and he and he said that, you know, I, I, I'm going through this problem in my body and it's been many, many years. Uh, uh, but one thing I want you to do is don't tell me that Jesus died on the cross and Jesus can forgive because I can prove to you that Jesus was just a man. I said, yeah, Jesus was a man, but he was not just a man. But he said, no, I'll prove to you. I'll prove that, you know, and I said, God, this guy is one intellectual guy. Please help me. Right. And long story short, we, you know, uh, I remember praying and uh, just, I didn't do any, you know, there was no like screaming, shouting, praying in tongues, nothing. Just said, God, open his eyes, remove that scales from his eyes, that he may see you. 
all of a sudden he just began to experience the presence of god he felt a burning sensation and just scales falling off and just a revelation of who god is came into his heart now how does this happen it is only when we are empowered right jesus was empowered can you can you imagine this who who was jesus he is a carpenter's son where was he most of the time in galilee some and and you know he was not famous he's not a big pharisee uh, and he's not from a rich family or a famous family no why do you think there were 10000s of people following him and did you ever think of that well, why did you know when he's preaching on the mountain why did 10000 people come you think they didn't have any other work or were they like okay we have nothing to do let's go see some miracles maybe some of them but 10000 people why because he, they knew there is something about this man he was empowered when we are empowered people will recognize demons will recognize and our work in the ministry will be fruitful yet right? so that's point number 1 point 2 where as an evangelist we must always know our audience right everywhere we see the lord jesus ministering he ministered with such wisdom right he knew his audience so let's see a couple of examples here first one luke 418 we already read to the poor let's read a second point to the lost sheep of israel matthew chapter 10 verse 5 and 6 let's read that matthew chapter 10 5 and 6 anybody can read with 12 jesus set out with the following instructions do not go among the gentiles or enter any town of the samaritans go rather to the lost sheep of israel thank uh, you was seven also no just five okay. and six yeah that's yeah. fine thank you john so so here jesus is appointed he's told his disciples okay go but don't go to the gentiles or to the samaritans but go first to the lost sheep of israel now we know right we always have to take text put it into context so we know that jesus was trying to first reach out to the to the own the israelites to the own to his own people and then to of course to others and and so when we are ministering to people right we will reach out to different you know people of different audiences there's the youth there are families there are teens there are children there are the uh, older age senior citizens now this is this is rule number 1 in preaching know your audience now i can't take a youth message and preach it to families who are sitting or imagine this i take a you know marriage and family course for teens and it's not going to be helpful for them as if uh, as for that time right so know your audience jesus knew his audience there were sinners there were lepers there were paralyzed people uh, there were people who were sick in their body oppressed demon possessed people and on the other hand there was the light right you have uh, uh, you know the bible says that joseph of arimathea was one of the you know believers of christ he was a rich man then you got the roman citizen who said come and pray because my servant is unwell right you got cornelius right so uh, uh, so so you we see that there is a beautiful blend right of both kinds of people to so know your audience know who you're ministering to right uh, now you know uh, when you look at the when jesus says the lost sheep of israel uh, it is they are lost why are they lost like like we mentioned right so from malachi god stopped sending prophets he said i'm not going to send any more prophets enough of prophets 
Israel as a nation has turned away from me. So I'm going to keep quiet. So for 400 years of silence, they were nothing but lost sheep without a shepherd. Right? They, didn't, they didn't know what they were doing. It was just monotonous religious beliefs. Right? 400 years. Imagine God not speaking for 400 years. Sometimes we go, oh, if it's two, three days, we feel, oh God, it's where are you? You haven't spoken. Right? Imagine 400 years. They don't know what is right, they don't know what is wrong. There is no moral standing. So Jesus comes and he begins to talk about, you know, lostness, a lot of parables, parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin. And, and he begins to focus on these lost people. You know, we may have a lot of things, but if we are lost, we are nowhere. And then there was this, the sinners, the, the, the meaning the lepers, the paralyzed. And you see the grace of God, even at the cross, uh, Jesus knew his audience. He says to the one, you know, you will be with me in paradise. What a powerful, powerful statement. Right? He knew that this person needs the gospel. He needs to, you know, uh, be saved. And there was a turning in his heart, which he recognized. Uh, and, and so when we are ministering to people, uh, we need to do it out of love, out of out of this whole thing of how Jesus did it as an evangelist. Right? Let's look at the next point. Third one is the message. Now, this is the most important part. Right? First, we looked at empowered. What if we are empowered? What if we have the right audience, but we have the wrong message? Is it going to bear fruit? Like, hey, God has anointed us, right? Empower, dunamis power inside us. It's just bursting, right? You've got the right audience, right? You're in a place where, you know, they are ready to receive the gospel. But what if the message is wrong? Uh, if the message is wrong, it's not going to help, right? It's not going to serve the purpose. So what is the message that the Lord Jesus preached? Now, if we look through the scriptures, you know, he spoke about two very important points and everywhere we see that, right? One, he spoke about repentance and surprisingly, second, he spoke about hell, right? Uh, you, know, some, you know, nowadays we talk about hell, they'll say, oh, you're a hellfire preacher. Don't preach about hell, only grace and goodness of God. Yes, the Lord Jesus did has more grace than any one of us, but he preached more on hell than anybody else, right? Uh, and so, of course, we he did it with love, not at not with condemnation. And so, first one, repentance, a complete turning away of heart, uh, which means you you leave the things of this world and follow Jesus, and that's what Jesus did, right? Now, as an evangelist, he, he, he shared the same message. He said, Peter, are you willing to follow me? Said, yeah, I'll come. No, not me, Lord. I, I'm not good enough. It's okay, come. So we could see that there was a change in heart. Right Now, it sounds very catchy, right? Uh, think of it. Uh, Jesus, follow me. Okay, Jesus says, follow me. Peter just drops his net and walks up. Wow. Now, we must understand that that's his business. That's his livelihood. He's got a wife and probably had children. We don't know. Uh, but we do know that he had a wife. He had a family to look after. What is he going to do following this man who's who he's met, maybe who he's seen, but met only once? Right? Why? because the message was too convincing. It was too convincing. True repentance brings conviction, right? So when we are preaching the message of Jesus Christ, the true gospel, 
that will bring repentance into people's heart right that that will bring conviction and that's what jesus did right he, he the disciples say i'm not worthy lord and what about matthew that's a wonderful uh, wonderful wonderful you know example where he says matthew you follow me he says i'm a tax collector nobody would want me nobody wants to talk to me first of and secondly they want they are angry with me because i'm taking you know tax from you all and giving it to the roman government and as a tax collector i'm betraying my own people and my own nation and you are saying follow me now what happened in matthew's heart there was a change complete turnabout right uh, because there was a message involved the true message of the gospel right of the kingdom of god repentance now with repentance jesus spoke about many things he was a teacher right and so he spoke about faith he 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 spoke about love grace every every aspect forgiveness beautiful right uh, remember when he he talked about faith you know, if you have faith as a mustard seed right and then a couple of uh, days later he says okay you go on and i will follow you what happens he walks on water first he teaches them and he, then he displayed it uh, you know, and, and he asked them where is your faith five loaves of bread and two fish feeding the thousands disciples go okay god jesus you you did it once but the second time i'm not sure do you think you can do it the second time you know i probably in jesus's mind it was like the message remains the same nothing changes bring what you have last time you took 12 one each this time how many do you want to take you see faith there lazarus is dead that this everyone are mourning and crying and jesus says don't worry i'm the resurrection i am the life you see the message there so god the lord jesus will give us these opportunities as an evangelist the message that we share is very important i remember this once uh you know many many years back i just became a believer and uh, I had invited one pastor. I had invited a couple of my friends who are, you know, uh, still drug drug addicts, and uh, they don't like, you know, anything about Christianity and all of that. Uh, and I told them, "You come home." Right? Uh, and so they they were kind. Of, they, you know, we were good friends, so they said, "Okay, we'll come." And I told them, "See, uh, just calling somebody to just speak to us. We can hear them. If you don't like it, leave it." So uh, uh, with great, uh, with a lot of difficulty, I, you know, convinced them. And these guys came home. They were like, you know, fully high. And uh, I wanted the gospel to touch them, right? I wanted them to really experience the power of God the way I did. Uh, and so I called this pastor. I said, you come, you preach nicely. You preach about Jesus, what Jesus did on the cross, and uh, you know how we find forgiveness and how He changes our lives. So I just gave him that. He came, he started preaching, and he started telling his own testimony. He started sharing about how what happened in another place, and this and that. And uh, you know, I was so upset uh, because all of them well by the by three sentences they were falling asleep and i saw that there was no effort taken um he was just randomly speaking some something which uh you know it didn't cut through right remember when the anointing is there people can feel it people can experience it right when we are empowered and uh, i'm not saying that he was not anointed but what i'm trying to say was there was no preparation and the message was not effective. 
right? He just said something and for 20 minutes he said, okay, do you want to give your life to Christ? Of course they are not going to give their life to Christ because it was he was not convincing enough. And I realized that day, what a, you know, uh, it, it was just I was so sad with what happened. I said, I'm never going to do this again. And I made sure that, you know, whenever I called somebody, I would listen to that person's message and then make them share it. Uh, because the message is important, right? Um, and after that, we did get opportunities to share with my friends, but uh, but that initial first time was a failure. Why? The message was wrong. The message, was, it was not wrong, but it was not effective, right? So the Lord Jesus delivered his messages very effectively, right? Uh, as preachers and teachers of the word, we must learn to do that. Deliver the message effectively, right? Especially as evangelists, no, you have probably five minutes with a person, right? Five ten minutes, and not more than that. So, you know, uh, now if we go on to, you do a survey, and. Uh, if you go online, you see these videos. It's the first 10 seconds. If the first 10 or 15 seconds is not catchy enough, we're going to skip. We're going to go to the next video. Yes. Right? All of us, maybe, you know, maybe open a message or we're opening a couple of songs or listening to a song, sometimes even worship songs. Oh, the first part itself is not, we skip. Oh, this person, I don't know who she is singing or who is he singing. Uh, we skip, right? So the message is the key, right? Uh, delivering the right message. Be minister as evangelists in faith. But the message delivered should be the right message. Let's go to the next point and then we can take a break. Fourth one is methods. What is the method the Lord Jesus used, right? Let's read Matthew chapter 9, 35 and 36. Matthew 9, 35 and 36. Yes, anybody can read. Matthew chapter 9, 35 and 36. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 and 36. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Let's also read uh, Acts 2.22. Acts 2.22. Yes, anybody can read? Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man created by God, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. Yeah, thanks, Jafina. So we see here the method was after preaching the gospel, there were signs and wonders. Now, we know the miracles that Jesus did, right? Plenty of them. He looked at the paralyzed and he said, be healed. He looked at the leper and he said, if you're willing, he'll be, yes, I'm willing. And healed him, right? And he did such mighty miracles. Uh, and this same work of the Holy Spirit continued on in the early church, in the book of Acts. Right? Remember Peter? What did he do? Peter's walking and he's doing shadow ministry. Everyone are being healed, right? Now, the Holy Spirit is the same. The outcome is signs, miracles, and wonders, but the way it happened may be different, right? So, for example, Jesus healed the blind in many places. He held 
their, their eyes in another place he spat on the ground put a pace and said go wash it uh, another place he just said be healed right but the outcome was the same the way he did it may have differed right uh, so the supernatural becomes natural and that's the method science and wonders right what we'll do is we'll take a break uh, we'll come back and continue from here right let's take 10 minutes we'll come back at 10 o'clock